This is Dr. Ted Hildebrandt in his New Testament History, Literature, and Theology course, lecture number 15, finishing up on prayer in the book of Luke in the Emmaus Road, and then proceeding into the synoptic problem. Well, welcome back. Um, today we are in the process of finishing our, I think it's our third or fourth lecture on Luke, and today we'll be done in just a few minutes on Luke. And then what I'd like to do is uh, examine the synoptic Gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke. Those three are called the synoptic Gospels, and we're going to look at them in kind of comparison, contrast type of thing in our next lecture, our second part of this lecture. So uh, let's finish up the book of Luke. And there was basically two things that I wanted to kind of, that we've missed so far in the book of Luke. And one of those is the nature of prayer in the book of Luke. And so what I just want to notice is some things here, like, for example, eight times Jesus prays in the book of Luke that are unique to Luke. So Luke, if you're looking for prayer, Luke is the gospel to go to. Eight times, seven are only found in this gospel. So Jesus prays eight times in Luke, seven of those times are unique to this gospel. So he has quite a bit to say about prayer, and... um, kind of want to contrast that to Matthew's comments on prayer, asking you shall receive, seeking you shall find. And uh, you've got to be careful with that kind of a statement in terms of some of the people will look at prayer as almost like a vending machine where you go up, you put your coins in, you pull the lever, and the candy drops down. And they kind of have a vending machine view of God and then a vending machine view of prayer, asking you shall receive. And they don't realize the complexities of prayer and things like that, just grabbing a simple statement out of Matthew, the Sermon on the Mount, and then trying to absolutize that, which we said uh, before. You've got to be really careful about uh, doing, absolutizing those statements and things. So Luke presents another side of prayer, and uh, we just want to look at that. Um, And there's two that I'd like to look at in particular. Uh, Both of them are found in Luke chapter 18. And actually what you have in Luke chapter 18 is two parables on prayer. So you have whole parables on prayer. And let me just read through the first one. This is the the prayer of the Pharisee and the tax collector. And this is in Luke chapter 18, verse 9. It says, To some who were confident in their own righteousness and looked down on everyone else. So that sets up this parable. Okay, They're confident in their own righteousness. And they look down on everyone else. So you can already see the kind of contrast. And then how is that kind of arrogance and that belittling of their fellow person, how is that going to play into prayer? Okay? So it starts out their attitude toward others, and then it's going to take it and and shift that toward prayer. And Jesus told them this parable. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee stood up and prayed about himself. God, I thank you that I am not like other men, robbers, evildoers, adulterers, or even this, and then you can see the, speaking kind of theoretically about, I'm glad I'm not like robbers, evildoers, adulterers, just speaking generically, but then he makes it much more personal, and and this Pharisee turns to, or even like this tax collector, and now he's getting close and, and to the person who's to his left or to his right, to this tax collector. I fast twice a week and give a tenth of all I get. And so this is how this man prayed, uh, com- in comparison of himself to everyone else, and ba- basically bragging to God about his fasting twice a week and his uh, paying a tenth of all he has, which is interesting because it does tell us something about the Pharisaic notion of religion, that the fasting was part of that, and they fasted twice a week, and they gave a tenth of everything they had. Now, it shifts then. I'm thankful that I'm not like other people, adulterers, murderers, and this tax collector. And now we're going to hear from the tax collector. But the tax collector stood at a distance. You get the notion that the Pharisee is up front, close, and, and kind of like in front of people, but the tax collector stood at a distance He would not even look up to heaven, but he beat his breast and said, and then this is what people call the Jesus prayer. And this is one of the most significant prayers in scripture. This is one that, uh, how should I say, I pray repeatedly, and people around the world pray repeatedly. It's a very short prayer, 
It's a kind of a breathing prayer that you can breathe out to God in a very short space of time, and it says this. This is the Jesus prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. He doesn't compare himself to anybody else. You notice that the Pharisee, when he was addressing God, was looking everywhere else. This tax collector, it's directly communication between he and God. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And then Jesus comments, I tell you the truth, this man, rather than the other, went home justified before God. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled, and he who humbles himself will be exalted. And what I think is interesting there is then this shows us that there's kind of some moral prerequisites to prayer. There's some moral prerequisites to prayer. And so this person, because he humbled himself, the tax collector humbled himself, God, be merciful to me, a sinner, he goes down justified. Very interesting, the word justified. This man, because of how he prayed, was considered justified before God. That the Pharisee was not in all his righteousness because he looked down on others and things. So this is a Jesus prayer. God, have mercy on me, a sinner. And that stance, that humble stance, is a really critical stance that when one, one approaches God, that one approaches not in arrogance but in humility, pleading, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. So that is a... That's a very short prayer. You've got the Lord's Prayer, Our Father which art in heaven. We, many of us know that and things. But this is just a one-liner. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And I think it's appropriate for people to pray that often, frequently, daily, hourly, and actually minutely, if there's such a word. So humility is kind of a, a basis versus pride as a, you know, the character quality of the person conditioning uh, the response to the prayer. Now, there's a second prayer that comes up, and this one is the woman and the unjust judge. The woman and the unjust judge. And this is another parable from Luke chapter 18. Luke chapter 18 starts out with this this one, and we'll just read through it. Then Jesus told his disciple a parable to show them that they should always pray and not give up. So this is about persistence in prayer, that they should always pray and not give up. And uh, this, uh, this, I think, is a response I, um, I've been told at various points in my life that when, if you trust God, you make your prayer to God, he knows what's on your heart, he knows what's on his heart, so you don't have to ask him more than once. It's like he, he knows what you want, and, and you know, to say it over and over and over again just becomes vain babbling, and Jesus said, you know, don't pray over and over again, um, you know, idle repetitions kind of thing. But here, Jesus talks about praying and always prayer and not give up. He said, and he's going to tell a parable now, in a certain town there was a judge who neither feared God nor cared about men. And there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him with a plea. Notice Luke again picks up on the widow. Remember we said before in the previous lecture that Luke picks up on the widow and he picks up on the only child kind of thing. So here's a widow Someone who's kind of disenfranchised in that culture, a needy person in that culture, is approaching a judge. What is a judge to do? A judge is to make justice for the, the widow, the orphans, and the fatherless, okay? And just uh, in the poor, the foreigners. And so the, the, the judge is to take care of and make justice for those who cannot get justice in the society. So here you've got this widow coming before the judge. The judge is a person of status. She is a person of low status. And she comes to this judge, and he cares neither about God, doesn't fear God or care about men. And she says to him, and there was a widow in that town who kept coming to him, notice that kept coming to him, with a plea, grant me justice against my adversary. Now the fact of the matter is, this is the parable, so we don't know the whole story. We never do know what, what was it that was bothering her, what was this injustice that she was, and what was it that this adversary had done to her, or was doing to her, we don't know that. And so the parables don't tell you all the little interesting details that you'd like to know. A parable is a story, and it's got a point. And so the parable is this parable is directed to that point. And uh, so we don't really know what the injustice was. But for some time, he refused. But finally, he said to himself, even though I don't fear God or care about men, yet because this widow keeps bothering me, 
I will see that she gets justice, so she won't eventually wear me out by her coming. Okay, end of parable. Then the Lord said, and the Lord said, listen to what the unjust says, judge says. And will not God bring about justice for his chosen ones who cry out to him by day and night? Notice the crying out by day and by night. People keep coming back to God, crying out by day and by night. Will he keep putting them off? I tell you, he will see that they get justice quickly. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And then all of a sudden at the end of this parable, you've got this jump to the, to the eschaton, to the, to the final days. Okay. However, when the Son of Man comes, will he find faith on the earth? And it's an interesting jump there. They will get justice. And then he puts it in that eschatological, in that end of days kind of thing, that, the, that God will render justice and then associates that justice with the final days there. So this has to do about persistence in prayer, praying the same thing and asking for the same thing over and over, and, um, and basically saying one ought always to pray and to not give up and not give up. And I think that's really an important thing. I think uh, 